Good evening friends. Welcome to Inspiring Conversations. Once again, today we are having a very interesting personality with us who is nationally and internationally known. Our guest for today's discussion of Inspiring Conversations is the man with many words. A theater personality, an actor, a director, an animal lover and a well-known name in the advertising world. My dear friend Mr. Bharat Dabolkar. a graduate in economics honors and studied law with specialization in interpretation of law trained in business management he started his career as a trainee in philips his breakthrough was when he joined dakuna associates in 1977 and from that moment he never looked back he launched an advertising agency zen communications which went on to become the fastest growing advertising agency in india for 2 years in a row he has been a jury member of the all india excellence in advertising for the advertising agencies association of india and the advertising club for almost 18 years he has a number of awards in his pocket he has won the advertising campaign of the year award for parlays tetra pak soft drink fruity he has won the combined advertising excellence trophy he has also won three international awards given by the international federation of advertising agencies usa He was chosen as one of the 50 most admired Maharashtrians by the Times of India in a book published by the Times Group. He has written and directed Bottoms Up. He has also written and directed 28 English plays and has launched a new musical comedy Blame It on Yashraj. He is known as the creator of the English language. Bharat Dabulkar has also anchored an adventure reality show called Shock TV and has also done the India's first advertising and marketing program. the dream merchants he has acted in 11 bollywood films with big names of the industry he has also acted in tamil malayalam telugu and marathi films he has conceptualized and produced a music video for shri atal bihari vajpayee the former prime minister of india based on one of his poems unki yaad kare apart from being an advertising king he also has a heart of gold which is seen by the number of animals he possesses which includes a kaku an african grey parrot a macaw 12 piranhas 10 golden pond fish and still counting i bring to you friends mr bharat dabolkar let us all welcome him with a loud round of applause we are going to have a very interesting uh, discussion today i am sure each one of us know who bharat dabolkar is but we would like to get some more insights and this gentleman has been known not only to this country but internationally also for a variety of aspects one is he is the person who made amul renowned the world over dr kurian definitely was the gentleman who was instrumental for the success of amul but the commercial success came because of its campaign which nobody can forget so this is a gentleman who did it a very unique person has a very unique way of living his life i was just chatting up with him creative people and intelligent people have a very different way of living their lives i was just chatting up with me, with him when he to- shared with me that he was once invited as a speaker by the indian navy and the indian navy admirals were also present for that particular program so they were to pick him up from a particular point and escort him on to bullets in full uniform naval uniform bharat dabolkar went to the navy colony in an auto rickshaw he has a private auto rickshaw which is fully transparent and he went in that these guys could not recognize him he had to wave out to them and then they escorted them and you can imagine the scene two fully uniformed naval officers and mr bharat dabolkar driving his auto rickshaw <laughs> in mumbai he lives in chembur he has a tree house he has got his own plot and a bungalow he has a tree house which has got six dogs lots of animals so he's a different person i would like to begin by asking bharat who is Bharat Dabolkar the entrepreneur how can you describe yourself of being an entrepreneur can we begin with that 
mean, I can't. But before I uh, begin, I must thank you for calling me here. I say this because I have had very embarrassing situations when I am called to speak as a chief guest. A few years ago, a lady came to meet me. She was, I think, the secretary of the Indo-American Society's Ladies' Wing. I think it's called Indus or something. And she came and said, uh, Mr. Zawarkar, why don't you come to our club and talk to our members on advertising? And very humbly I asked her, I said, why are you calling me? There are so many other people who are better than me in advertising, who are better speakers. I finished saying this and that day I realized how ruthlessly honest women can get on your face. That lady looked at me straight in the eye and said, yes, Mr. Davolka, we know there are people who are better than you in advertising, who are better speakers, but most of them are out of town. <laughs> and last minute, we can't get anybody else, so why don't you come this year? Next year, we'll try and get a better speaker. <laughs> It happened once again, we have the Advertising Club of Mumbai, which is the largest advertising club in the world. We have more members than any other advertising club in the world. And that secretary came to meet me and said, uh, Bharat, uh, we have a tea meeting, why don't you come and speak to our members? And I think I'm a sucker for punishment. I said, why me? And he said, no, this is just a tea meeting, not too many people attend this, only office bearers and things. <laughs> when we have a dinner meeting, we have lots of people attending, so we call good speakers. So when Rajesh invited me, I haven't asked him, why me? <laughs> I know why me, don't tell me. <laughs> well, uh, that is a fun part of it. I've been chasing him for the last three months. And I've just got him for this particular event. And uh, seven to eight days back, he gave me jitters when he said, can you shift the date? I said, Bharat, the venue is booked, the invites have gone, the whole world knows it. The production is in place. I can't change the date. And you know the challenges of getting a venue in Mumbai. So after some time, uh, some time he comes back and he says, okay, no problems. I have readjusted my schedule. So that is how difficult he is to get. So just forget the joke part of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so answering your question, uh, being an entrepreneur, very honestly, uh, I'm very bad at that because I have always looked at the creative side of every business that I started. In advertising, when I started, I was very honest about this, that I don't know much about business. I don't have that kind of business sense. So I had partners who knew, had the business sense. So I think the first key to being a good entrepreneur is to know what your weaknesses are. You shouldn't go with the feeling that I know everything and I can handle everything. You can't. Everybody has limitations. Everybody has expertise in a certain area. And when I realized that my expertise was in creative execution of the campaigns that my clients gave me, I could not handle the business part of it. I had partners who took care of that. In fact, when we were starting the agency, one of our big clients, R. Mohan, of, uh, who launched Goodnight and Hit and all these products, we went to him and said, uh, will you give us your business? And he said on one condition, that Bharat should not be burdened with any, any business problems, banks, loans, other things. He said in Kerala, we have a, a saying that they have a, a temple bull who's left alone. He, nobody touches him. They just, he does what he wants. He, he goes and eats where he wants and nobody does anything. So he said, if you can treat Bharat like a temple, Kerala temple bull, then I'll give you our business. And so these guys said, yeah, I yeah, will treat him like a temple bull. And so the point being that I only took care of the creative aspect of the agency. The business aspect was taken care of by others, which is why it worked very well. The only thing that I did, I think, uh, is that I thought ahead in terms of what we could do. We started our agency in uh, 91, and uh, we had fantastic local clients. We had Indian clients who were very good. We had Amul, we had the entire Parley Agro, we launched Fruity, Appy, Bailey Water, we had Goodnight and Hit, and we had Bank of India and State Bank and Exim Bank. And, and we had this thing that the whole world was going global. And we had this thing that we don't have to worry because we have all these fantastic clients, so we don't have to look at any tie-up with any agency. And then we start, started realizing that our clients were selling out to international companies. One fine morning, Transelectra, which was a good night company, was sold to Godrej, who then sold part of it to Sarali. Parley parts, we were handing thumbs up, which was sold to Coke. And we suddenly realized that what is happening is we may find that we have Indian clients, but Indian clients are not remaining Indian. And we had to look at some sort of a tie-up. And we tied up with what was that time the third largest agency in the world called Publicis. It's a French agency. 
today it's a, the, the largest agency in the world and i think you brought that agency into india as a managing director yeah and uh, that was one of the the, the most uh, the fastest link up anybody could have with a foreign company i still remember we were talking to some people and we realized that if we had to talk to a foreign collaborator we appointed people who were experts in doing that and they came and said uh, what he called in accounting terms he said it's called the dressing up the bride that you have to do your account so well that it looks like a great thing that you've done for the last 5 years and we were doing all that and we were talking to different people and uh, i got a fax that time there were no mobile i mean there were mobile phones but there were no internet wasn't so active from the gentleman who was the asia pacific chairman of publicis a frenchman stationed in singapore and he said look uh, we are interested in linking up with you can you come down to paris whoever is in the position to has the authority to sign a contract can they come down to paris and uh, myself my partner and a finance guy because we didn't understand finance we went to paris and i still remember we went in for a meeting morris levy who is the chairman still the chairman of publicis walked into the room and we were we had carried a whole presentation about our agency the advertising agency scenes in india our place in that what accounts we have what campaigns we have done and we were doing all this and this gentleman morris levy walked in and said uh, uh, nice to meet you guys he said i have heard that you are uh, famous in india what does that mean that people sort of you sit in the cab and people turn around and take your autograph and things i said no no not that kind of famous but i do theater and things so i am known so he said do you understand anything about finance and i said no then he said then why are you sitting in this meeting why don't you come with me and i'll show you around the agency and i went with him my people sat behind and they finished that entire collaboration by the evening the next morning we signed a, a contract with them and we became publicis zen in the next one day's time and much later when i met him i asked morris levy i said i was amazed because people were thrilled that you could sign a whole thing like this in one day i mean of course then there was a procedure of due diligence and all that that happened later but that contract that we will do this the mou was signed in one day and i asked him i said how was that possible and morris levy very honestly told me he said bharat we are french jews we know our business we know how to deal we are buying agencies world over we are linking up with agencies in every country on this planet we know that when we start and start negotiating you'll ask for 10 we'll offer you 5 and we'll settle for 7 so that's a formula we go by we all know that you'll ask for more and we'll offer you less knowing that we'll finally settle midway he saying what i like to do is i like to come and meet people to find out if i like the people i want to work with he said when i walked in there and when i said do you understand finance if you don't come with me that's a sign to my people that i like these guys i wouldn't mind working with them otherwise i wouldn't take you around to show my agency then financial things don't matter because it's a question of negotiations but if i didn't like you people this deal wouldn't have gone through no matter how financially attractive it was but he said that was a signal to my the top finance guy the cfo that if i have taken bharat out and said i'll show you the agency <clears throat> that means i like these guys and go ahead and sign the agreement and i think this is how great business works i mean the very fact that they are the number one agency means that they have done the same thing world over so i think business is not just about how your money part synchronizes it's how you're dealing with people that you can get along with because that's the long term way of looking at this because money link ups are very short term things may change overnight but if you like the people it continues for a very very long time now we've had publicis in india for the last uh, 14 years and it's working very well publicis is the largest agency they own sachi worldwide they own leo burnett worldwide they own japanese agencies they and i think this is the way they've grown that they've bought into people they have not bought into furniture and and uh, account books so i think any business that deals with people and buys into people has a great chance of success what could you say that what transpired in that one day which could influence the deal to go through in just a day's time what transpired there there must be a that few think, statements few think, information exchanges that which their, triggered that i think their account people were smarter than ours they really knew that they, they, they really knew deal. what to do a thing and they uh, as he said we are french jews he said you can't compete with french jews <laughs> he said you can't compete with jews and french jews are worse he said so i think it it went off in a day because i think they were smarter than us
uh, Bharat, we are all entrepreneurs here where we know the importance of branding, marketing and advertising. What we would like to know from you is, what is the difference and what is the similarity between branding, marketing and advertising? See, advertising is just a small part of marketing. Advertising is not, is the wrong notion that people feel we have to be creative in advertising. Advertising has to sell a product. Advertising doesn't have to win awards. If you win awards because you've done something good, it's fine. Like for Amul Bhatta, we used to win an award every year. But Amul had an 80% market share. It still has an 80% market share. So Amul could do the kinds of thing it did because of two reasons. One is a great product. Good advertising can't sell a bad product. You can make a consumer buy it once. You can't make it buy it a second time. And the other was a guy like Dr. I think 90% of the credit for what Amul, the entire Amul organization goes to this one man called Dr. Kurian. It's very easy to find creative people. There are millions of creative people. It's very difficult finding a client like Dr. Kurian. Here was a man who came and said, I know nothing about advertising. I know all about milk and milk products. I don't understand advertising, so don't come and show me what you do. Do whatever you want to do. I won't ask you any questions. Can you believe a client who was putting in good money behind a, a product? I, I mean, I'll give you an example. Why did Amul become so popular? Because it was topical. Every hoarding that went up wasn't brilliant, but it was very topical. And how could it be topical? I'll give you an example. If there was a, a Wimbledon final happening on a Sunday, and if there was McEnroe and Bog playing in that finals, I would do one hoarding on McEnroe and one on Bog. Give it to a hoarding contractor and say, whitewash the hoarding, put a scaffolding up, at night, 10 o'clock, you call me up. And if McEnroe had one, I would tell him, ek number ka hoarding lagao. And he would start painting that hoarding at 10 o'clock. Next morning, if you were driving to office, in your morning paper, you would read that McEnroe had one. And there would be a Amul Butter hoarding with a joke on McEnroe. Now, that wouldn't have been possible if there was a client to meet on a Monday morning and show this to. And Dr. Kurian said, do what you want to do. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, lovely strategy. So... I think great businessmen that I have met, and I've met lots of them, I'll name them as we go along, have this great ability to judge people and then let them do what they're good at. They always say, Dr. Kurian said, I have a choice of going to 4,000 agencies. We are a big name. We can go, and any agency in this country would take our account. If I have chosen you because I feel that you are good, then I can't start interfering into what you are doing because I don't understand this business, which very few people do. Advertising is one thing that everybody has some views on and they all get involved. In fact, there was one product I launched. Uh, there was a gentleman, a very nice gentleman called Vikas Chudiwala. They are, I think, the biggest uh, pine oil manufacturers in the country. And we launched Dr. Cools, which was uh, years ago. And Vikas and I were working on this for a very, very long time and on the packaging, the wrapper of that Dr. Cools, many meetings. And finally, when the whole thing was almost ready, I went to his office at Nariman Point and Vikas was sitting with his wife and his brother-in-law who had come from Jaipur or something. And Vikas said, Abhi ye, my brother-in-law has come. He is like a consumer. Unko dikhate hai kya hai. So we showed it to that guy and he said, Kuch maza nahi aaya isme, you know? So he said, Agar ye bolte hai, he is a consumer, so let's change it. Now, we had worked on this for so long, so I went back to my office. By the time I reached there, Vikas had called me up again. Saying, Bharat, nothing to change. I couldn't say it in front of my wife. But, <laughs> but my brother-in-law is an idiot. He doesn't understand much. But, you know, <laughs> like we have a thing in Hindi that Sari dunya ek taraf, Joru ka bhai ek taraf. So, he's saying, I had to say this in front of him, but nothing to be changed. He's going back to Jaipur. Don't worry about this. <laughs> but the point is, everybody has a point of view about advertising, about engineering they may not have. You never argue with a doctor. You don't argue with an engineer. But with an advertising agency, every Tom, Dick and Harry has a point of view. And I, on my email, if I ever send you an email, I have a thing written which says, Camel is a horse designed by a committee. committee. <laughs> you know, if a committee sits down to design a horse, then everybody has a point of view. Somebody said, let's make his legs a little longer. You know, somebody says, let's give him a hum so he can hold on to him. So that it's easier to sit on him. At the end of it, you don't get a horse, you get a camel. <laughs> so if you want a horse, don't have a committee. I always tell my clients, if we come to you with ideas, you don't like them, reject them in, in toto. Say, I don't like this and drop it. Don't get 10 people to come and say, let's change this, let's change the color. 
And as I said, Amul worked because a guy like Dr. Kurian was there who did this. And because I used to do Amul and we used to win every award every year on outdoor campaigns, then Air India came to me. Air India once upon a time was as popular as Amul. I think when Bobby Kuka used to do that. And it wasn't that after Bobby Kuka, his agency couldn't have done it. But I think it was becoming more a government organization by that time. So Air India came and said, you do Amul and you guys win the awards, which we used to win earlier. Would you mind doing our campaigns? And I said, sure. And we started doing Air India. Now, to give you a comparison, if I had done a McEnroe holding on Air India, the Amul would go up Monday morning, it would be painted. Air India, Sunday the match would get over, then I would phone them up on Monday morning and say, I've done a holding on McEnroe. So they said, okay, uh, come in the evening because we are in a meeting since morning. So <laughs> then Monday afternoon or evening, I would go and meet them. Then they would say, we think it's pretty good, but the director is not in town. He's in Delhi. He's coming back tomorrow afternoon. So let's try and meet up in the afternoon. Then Tuesday afternoon, you would meet him. Then he would say, okay, but uh, can we have a look at some alternatives? Some other lines. Then on Wednesday or Thursday, we would go with some other lines. Then he would say, looks fine, but that background color, instead of just having white, can we make it yellow or green? By that time, the Air India holding would go up, it would be the next Monday. When it didn't make sense anymore, because by that time, lots of other things have happened. And uh, the McEnroe winning Wimbledon has not been a topic that everybody wants to talk about. So uh, the same clever holding would not have any takers, because a week has gone in between. So we, in advertising, we always say every client gets the advertising they deserve. It's the same people who work on your campaign. So why does that same agency give some brilliant campaigns to somebody and they can't give even mediocre campaigns to some other clients? It's because the clients interfere. So advertising is a small part of marketing, but that has to be left alone to people. You, know? you can have a team that guides the agency. If you don't interfere too much with the creative, you get great campaigns. And that's how you sell products. It's the great campaigns that sell products. I mean, if, uh, when they did that uh, heavy quick campaign, when Ogilvy did that with that fisherman sitting and catching the three fish, if they had gone and said, look, instead of using this guy, why don't you use Shah Rukh Khan because it'll be better, <laughs> uh, then they could have done that. But that ad wouldn't have been as cute as it was. It was the, the casting of that thing, that the guy was a a sophisticated guy sitting there with all the fishing gear and this one little Malayali guy sitting with a, a stick and three drops of fabric. Now that's what made that so much nicer. See, using film stars is an easy way of doing advertising. Nowadays, advertising replaces ideas with film stars. And they're all called, they're all called brand ambassadors. <laughs> You know, actually, brand? actually, Bharat, even the politicians are being replaced by film stars. Yeah. Very soon you will see politicians acting in films now. Yeah, and they'll do a better job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, even film stars, since we are talking of that, um, calling them brand ambassadors is a misnomer. They're models, they're not brand ambassadors. You know, brand ambassador is somebody who lives the values of a brand. I launched Amul's a health drink like Bone Vita, it was called Nutramul years ago. And we used Dara Singh as a brand ambassador, as a model. Because we had done a survey and found that in every, whether it was south, east, north, west, Dara Singh was this icon of fitness and health. So using Dara Singh for Nutramul, you could have called him a brand ambassador. If tomorrow somebody was launching a petrol that's like a speed petrol, and they used Nareen Karthikian, who's a Formula One driver, that's a brand ambassador. But if you use Shah Rukh Khan for Santro, that's not really a brand. I mean, why, why, what has Shah Rukh Khan got to do with a Santro? <laughs> he doesn't own a Santro. He doesn't know about cars. So why would he be a brand ambassador? When you have Karina Kapoor, who's a brand ambassador for a watch. No, why? I, mean, I don't even know if she comes on time for a shooting. So, <laughs> I mean, how does she become a brand ambassador for a watch? So these are models, you know, and people because they can, companies because they can afford film stars, they are using it and somehow agencies feel that if you have a Shah Rukh Khan, you don't really need an idea, which is very wrong, you know, because some of the, the brightest advertising does not have film stars. And using a film star, I think the only film star who's really done well and sort of added value to the campaign that they've done is Amir Khan, because 
he acts it out and things. They were just getting Amitabh Bachchan to just come and say, whatever, cool oil or some bank or whatever. People remember the, people remember Amitabh Bachchan. They forget what, I've forgotten what that oil was. I just know that he advertises for some oil that is very cool. Very cool. Using anybody, it makes no sense. They're using film stars left, right and center. A film star is supposed to be because they're known all over India and they're better actors than models. They can add value to what you're doing, but you have to have an idea first. They can enhance an idea. They can replace an idea. And I think a lot of advertising goes wrong because ideas are being replaced by either, either uh, film stars or scantily clad women. Hmm? <laughs> That's another thing which is very stupid. I've never understood that. I mean, why do you have to be creative to have a girl in a bikini in your ad? Hmm? Your local panwala can put a, a bikini clad girl and say, Sharma Pan Bhandar or whatever and, and people would look at it. You don't need to be in advertising. Hmm? In fact, I personally feel that it's like saying that I have no creative ideas, that's why am I using... I mean, I'm not saying this because I'm a great supporter of women's causes or something like that. <laughs> I'm not. In fact, I honestly feel that in India, women have it far better than us poor men do. I'll give you an... I'll, I'll, Ma'am, I'll give you an example. Now it's getting very hot in Mumbai. It's like temperatures are going up. Now, let's say on this Sunday, I'm sitting in the house and... Electricity goes off, so there's no AC, there's no fan working, so I go to my terrace, take off my clothes, and I'm lying, I'm not troubling anybody, I'm taking off my clothes and lying on my own terrace. And if in the next building, if there's a lady staying there, and she goes up to her terrace to dry her clothes, or dry her papad, I don't know why women go to terraces in the afternoon <laughs> for, but, but if she goes to the terrace, and she sees me lying there without clothes, she can phone out the police and have me arrested for indecent exposure and my life is over, you know. People say, you know, he didn't look the type, but you know what he was doing on a Sunday afternoon? He was lying without clothes on his terrace. Can you believe this? Life is over. Now, the following Sunday, if that lady's house lights go off <laughs> and she goes to the terrace, takes off her clothes and she's lying down there and I go on my terrace and look at her, again, she can phone up the police and have me arrested. <laughs> For being a peeping Tom. <laughs> so either way, men don't win. <laughs> so when I say I don't agree with showing scantily clad women in a thing, I'm creatively, I feel that it's like giving a resignation and saying I have no other ideas. Because if I have a better idea, I don't need a scantily clad woman. I don't need a film star. I, need, I have an idea that works. Amul had a cartoon figure. It has an 80% market share. Fruity, when we launched it, we never had a film star. I launched all the Tata tea, all the teas of Tata tea. We never had a film star except in the south at one point we started using Mohanlal. But we had no, we used to just in fact advertise only the Munar tea estates. And it worked brilliantly. Kanan Devan, which was a brand, Tata brand in the south in Kerala, was the number one brand. They didn't have scantily clad women, they did not have film stars. So advertising is about ideas. And the best thing advertising has to keep in mind, and I think all of you in every business, you have to keep in mind is, who are you selling your products to? In advertising, we call them target groups, which means that who is your target group? You must know whether you are selling an advertising campaign or you are selling a product or you are just, com in, in any communication, you must know who the person on the other side of the table is. You could be saying the most brilliant thing, you could have the most brilliant product. You try and sell it to a wrong audience, it doesn't work. I, I learned this in an embarrassing way. I think I learned all my lessons in embarrassing ways. I used to do this play called Bottoms Up. And it was all kind of skits and things which I used to keep on changing. And between every two skits, we used to have what we called a mid-curtain joke, which meant that while the actors went and changed their costumes and makeup and all that, Instead of the audience sitting there in the audience in darkness and saying a lousy player, let's leave or whatever they say. Let's give them something that they have to watch. So we used to do, whoever wasn't involved in the other skits, they would come and do a little, a joke. So once we had, uh, you know, Arshad Varsi used to act in my place. He was a dancer in my place. And Ruby, Ruby Patel and uh, Sunita Rao, who is a big singer, they were all in my place. Shamak Davar, they used to all act with me. So we had this little joke of his mother taking her daughter to the zoo and this 
guide is taking them around. And the mother says, uh, are you enjoying your visit? And the daughter says, yeah, mummy, lovely. Look at all those giraffes and monkeys and elephants. And the mother says, any questions for mummy? And she says, tell me, mummy, how do lions make love? And the mother looks very embarrassed and says, how do lions make love? I don't know, darling. All your father's friends are Rotarians. <laughs> and we did this for some 200 shows. We all, always got some fantastic applause. Once we were doing a show at Bhaidas. Yeah. And Arsha and Ruby and Sunita went out and did this joke and there was pin drop silence. Nobody even smiled. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong till the producer came running and said, are you mad doing this joke here? This show is sponsored by the Lions Club of Ville Parley. <laughs> so that day I realized the importance of knowing who you are talking to. <laughs> but that is so important in any communication. Bharat, what would you prefer as an ideal situation as an entrepreneur? You choosing clients or clients choosing you and what happens most of the times? In advertising, I can only speak from my experience, which is advertising. Uh, clients choose us. We don't have a choice. So when they choose you, what are the parameters for you to go ahead with that particular client? I'll tell you one thing. I mean, I don't have personally, and I'm honest, I don't have the courage to say this. But I worked with a man called Sylvester Dikuna in Dikuna Associates. And he had one diktat. He said, we handled advertising for Indian Cancer Society. We will not take on any tobacco account, any cigarette account. Those days, cigarette ac advertising was allowed. Now it's not allowed. But and no matter how lucrative it was, how much money there was, Sylvester Dikuna made a point that we will not touch any cigarette account. That needed tremendous courage. Because, because they were the paymasters at that time. They were big spenders. Liquor and cigarettes were big spenders in those days. And he said, we will not do this. And it's amazing. I mean, see, advertising agencies don't choose clients. We go, clients normally call 20 agencies to make presentation and then and pick one that they feel is the best. So we don't have a choice. In advertising, we always go with, the only thing we do is, uh, we try and understand what the product is and try and guide them. Like when Parley's came to us and said, we want to launch. See, Parley, uh, Ramesh Chavan had a drink called Maza. And then Prakash wanted to launch a similar thing. So he came to us and said, I want to launch a mango drink. I was handling Amul milk that time. We had launched the first Tetra Pak in India. So our advice to Ramesh was instead of going, uh, Prakash was instead of going in a bottle, which Maza was in, let's do something more innovative. And I said, we are dealing with this company called Tetra Pak, a Swedish company for Amul. And why don't we launch a Tetra Pak drink? And then Fruity became the first small Tetra box drink. Now, agencies can contribute that way. We can advise clients on what is good for them. And if the clients are wise and they treat the agencies as their partners and not just suppliers, which I think every company must do to no matter who your suppliers are because they're experts in their own business. You must treat your suppliers as partners because then that gives them a feeling of ownership. If you keep treating all your suppliers and all the people that you deal with as just suppliers, then it's a money relationship. You pay them, they supply. But if you make them feel that they're a part of this business, they come up with some fantastic ideas. You have suppliers who come up with the kinds of suggestions that you could never get from your own company. So, Advertising agencies contribute in these ways. We've done that. Companies or products, product owners or service owners, service industries, they engage advertising agencies so that they can get a step ahead of their competition. As an entrepreneur who's into the advertising business, how do you handle your own competition with fellow uh, advertising agencies? See, advertising is all about because uh, things have changed now, but when we were in advertising in an active way, the world over, advertising worked on one principle of a 15% commission. And the clients never paid the agency. The media paid the agency. So if you had an advertising uh, ad released in Times of India, which cost 1,000 rupees, you didn't pay the agency. Times of India gave 15% back to the agency. So it was a 15% commission business. So no matter which agency you went to, you didn't spend money because you were not paying the agency. The, whether it was you went to Lintas or you went to Dikunas or Publicis, media was paying the agencies. So you are not benefiting in any way. So the only differentiator was a creative campaign that they did. So all clients used to call for creative pitches 
and that's the worst part of advertising is that you are constantly fighting to not just get an account but retain an account. Because for big clients, I mean, if we had Amul or if we had Tata's or if we had Parley's, these were fantastic blue chip accounts. And every agency in town wanted to work on those. So they would keep on approaching these clients and saying, we have a better idea than what you're doing right now. And the client would say, okay, show me, because it's, finally he wants to improve his own business. And we had to complete, con constantly be one step ahead of the competition, which meant that we had to constantly think more innovative, more creative ideas, which is what is, I think, stressful in advertising, which is what right, they say advertising is a stressful business and advertising guys get, get drink all the time. It's because of that. <laughs> Except How me. In the I have in my life, there's one thing I must say, I mean, not you, because when I go and talk to students, I say this, that in my life, I have never smoked a cigarette. I don't know how to, ho how to hold a cigarette. If I act in a film and they say you have to smoke because somehow, I think Hindi film directors are pretty dumb, all of them. They somehow believe that a villain won't look villainish unless he has a cigarette or a drink or, a, or he's chasing <laughs> after a woman to rape her. I think villains can look brilliantly villainous without smoking, drinking or chasing women, you know. But somehow, I mean, I fight on television channels with everybody. I fight with Mahesh Bhatt and everybody. Where they go and say, how can they stop smoking in films, you know. We are creative, curtailing our creativity. And I always say, why do you need to have a smoker as a villain to show creativity? There are lots of ways of doing this. And you can do it with expressions. You can do brilliant stuff with... But the point is, I have never smoked in my life and I have never touched liquor in my life, not even wine or beer. And I say it to youngsters because they somehow believe that in any glamorous profession, because in advertising we attend five parties every week and there's liquor flowing freely. I have launched all Vijay Malia's liquors. <laughs> I used to handle McDowell and everything, McDowell number one and Honeybee Brandy and Royal Treasure Rum and uh, Signature Whiskey and... London Pilsner beer, all are launched by me. They're all my, my brands. And I've never touched it. I've never in my life touched either beer or wine or even champagne when we celebrate our anniversaries. So I think I'm the only exception in advertising who does that. Fantastic. I think India, India's only... <laughs> India has only two film stars who do one movie a year. One is Bharat Dabolkar. Yeah. One is Bharat Dabolkar and one is Amir Khan. <laughs> we are the only two guys who do one film a year. The only difference is Amir Khan gets thousand films offered. He does one film. I get one film offered, which I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the best guy for acting. In, I'm the worst. I'm the worst actor in Bollywood. I, when I write my own plays and direct my own plays, I take the smallest possible role because I'm the worst actor I've met. But Bollywood somehow, it doesn't matter. They sort of, just take you for the way you look or whatever. <laughs> but I love acting in South Indian films. I've done a film with Rajni Kant, who it's a different story. I mean, Rajni Kant was an eye opener. I've never in my life, I spent 10 whole days with him in Mysore shooting. And in my life, I've never met any human being who's as confident and as humble as Rajni Kant. And I know everybody. I know everybody in Bollywood, big stars. Rajni Kant is a complete different kettle of fish. He's the most confident and the most humble man I've ever met. But I like acting in South Indian films because when I act badly, they feel I'm doing so because I don't understand the language. <laughs> so they say, Jane do, you know, let him go because he doesn't know what he's saying. In Hindi, they know I, they, Hindi or Marathi, they know I know the language and I'm still acting badly. So they keep trying to correct me. Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, they never correct me. One shot, they let it go because... Uh, so I love South Indian films. <laughs> well, that's a brilliant, brilliant attitude to your uh, personal business model. Uh, Bharat, what, what I would like to ask you is, in any creative industry as an entrepreneur, the worst threat is not somebody taking your client. The worst threat is somebody taking away your most creative person, which is called as poaching. So how do you do poaching for your agency? And how do you avoid your people being poached. In advertising, that has been, uh, like in every other field, I guess, that's been one uh, major problem because uh, the moment you are good, you are known. When we go to an ad club awards function, you see who, which agency is winning the awards. You know who are the guys who are writing those ads. So you people come and say, we'll give you a huge salary jump or we'll give you a better designation. And it becomes difficult. I mean, there are people, once you are all happy together, working together. Like in Zen, 
we had uh, uh, all the people that we had, I don't think we had any people leaving Zen and working elsewhere till we became publicists and we became a bigger agency. The Zen lot remained very loyal. We all worked together. Either they were not very good, that's why nobody wanted them, all of us. But whatever the reason, we all stayed together till we became publicists. But I think the bigger threat for most businesses is not poaching by other competitors, it's not knowing who your competition is. I think in recent times, most companies that have gone wrong have gone wrong because they didn't know where to look for their competitors. I mean, there are some shining examples. I remember Sony launched the world's first uh, Walkman. They were the innovators of that and they started and they were looking at Sharp and Panasonic and who were their competitors. And whatever Sharp was doing or Panasonic, Sony was watching them carefully and doing something better. They never looked at a company called Apple because that was not their competition. Apple was a computer company. They never realized that one day Apple could come up with an iPod and wipe out Walkman from the business. They were not even looking at Apple. Or if you look at the, the camera manufacturers, the, the Canons and Sony or whatever, they were looking at each other and saying Canon has this thing with this. They were not looking at a mobile Nokia. phone yeah. manufacturer who will have a camera on their phones. Or a Kodak film was looking at other, maybe Fuji film as their competition. They didn't realize that maybe digital things will come and you will not need a film anymore. So all these businesses have gone wrong, not because they were doing something wrong. They were not looking at the, they didn't know where the competition is coming from. I always give this example that there was a time when any industry was like a boxing ring. You had one main competitor. You always had one main competitor. When we, I launched Videocon in this country. And when I was launching Videocon, the dudes told me that our biggest competitor at that time was BPL. They were into television and they said that's the competition that we have. Because they, are, they make more television sets than we do. But internationally, as a total thing, we make more television, so we are number one. But BPL was their competition. Today, it's not like a boxing match where you are looking at your competitor. Today, I think business is like a billiards table. You don't know which ball is being hit where and where it's going to take and deflect and come and hit you from which side. So, not knowing who your competition is the biggest fear for every business. Where are the developments taking place? Who are the guys who are trying to get in some other way? As I said, Walkman, which is a, a, a music, a, a mobile music device, why should they look at a computer company? How would they ever think that Apple would come up with a smaller thing called iPod and give you more music than a Walkman could do. So, I think the biggest challenge for a business is not people poaching your people, but it's about being aware of the changing world, you know. So, suddenly one fine morning you can uh, wake up as an entrepreneur and understand that some revolution has taken place which has wiped completely out. wiped out your business like I said, model. Mo mobile phones have wiped out mainly cameras, they wiped music out systems. music systems, it's everything on one thing, you get mobile phones with uh, whatever. Great. So, you advise the entrepreneurs to be attentive, knowledgeable, and even researching then, all the time? You have to be, but even then you still may not know. You may, because you are looking at other people like you who are doing similar things. How do you look at other people who are not even in your vision, uh, anywhere near your uh, periphery? How do you, it's just being alive, but that, that doesn't mean, that doesn't guarantee that you will know who is coming at you. Because they're different people. Technology is going in different ways and they're doing different kinds of things. Whoever would have thought that a fax machine will not be required after, and now you get fax machines for 2000 rupees. You don't need a fax machine, they're emails now. So it's not the fault of the guy who made the fax machine or the guy who manufactured fax machines. It's that technology has suddenly gone beyond a fax machine which was not in their thing. So it's a thing about you can't remain in the same business and say we'll still fight. The thing you have to innovate and go with that business. What are the parameters that an entrepreneur thinks about when he wants to do an international business? Like for example, you, you have your business activities going on in India and you also have your businesses happening internationally. Yeah. And of all the places you have chosen the place, Tanzania. So what were your thoughts behind it and what made you select that path? Well, I didn't. Somebody called me and said, do you want to set up an agency? Yes, so I did. Oh. <laughs> I mean… <laughs> It is reverse engineering, I mean, you got the customer no, in your setup. I mean, I can sit here and sort of tell you that, you know, we'll, I looked at international things and 
looked at the pros and cons. That's, that's not true. I had a friend of mine who was working as a marketing director in Tanzania and he said, Bharat, uh, we, the entire business in Africa is owned by Gujaratis. So if you can speak Gujarati, you don't need to learn Swahili or any other African language. <laughs> so he said, all the businesses are owned by Gujaratis here and they are handled by uh, South Indians, Malayalis who are the CEOs of the agencies or the companies and Maharashtrians who are working in this thing. So it's like in India. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I'm working as a marketing director. Do you want to come here and start an agency? So I said, okay. So I went there. I, I personally had a fascination for Africa. Uh, but I just went there and they said, uh, set up an agency. So eight years ago, I set up an agency in Tanzania. And now we handle business in Tanzania and Kenya and, and Djibouti. And I'm very comfortable because I've grown up with Gujaratis. I speak, read and write Gujarati. So I am at home in Africa. <laughs> Fantastic. That's the new Gujarat for us, huh? Going to Africa. Yeah, it's the most fantastic, it's the most, uh, that's the new El Dorado, as people say. I mean, Obama came there with 200 businessmen a year ago. China is already there. Indians are going there. I just heard that in the next five years, Tanzania and Mozambique will produce either more gas or more oil than the entire Middle East. Wow. So Africa is uh, this growing continent. And uh, lots of people, lots of countries, China is looking at it. Every time I fly, I have had this agency for eight years. I have more and more Chinese on my flight. Yeah, these days you see more Chinese out of China than in China. China is… They are there in every part of the world. They are very smart guys. I mean, China, they do things like they built the Tanzania. They are crazy about football. Africa is… All Africa is crazy about football. That's, we are crazy about cricket. They are about football. Chinese have built the best international standard football stadium in Dar es Salaam, free of cost, in exchange of, I think, 10,000 work permits for their people. They are now in the process of building one of the biggest highways in Dar es Salaam, and they do it free. In exchange, they get work permits for their people. They're building the airports. So Chinese are doing this thing in a, in a great way, and I think they've beaten Americans and everybody else in this race to own Africa. They are in every African country. Since you are in the service industry, what according to you is a good pattern of client servicing? Have you set a pattern or you leave it to your team to manage it? No, what I tell people about, uh, as I say, I can only talk about advertising because that's the only industry I know about. Although I'm a lawyer, I never practiced law. So, I mean, if I can afford a black coat now, I can start practicing, but, <laughs> but I've never practiced law. Uh, I did law because I wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to be an IPS officer. That was my ambition. So, uh, in advertising, I tell all my people that the best way to retain a client or get a client is that you must know more about the client's business than the client does. You are not just a chap who's going and selling a, a layout to a client. The client must get the feeling that you know as much about his business, you know as much about his suppliers, as much about his product as he does. That's the best way of getting a client and that's the best way of retaining a client. If you can sit across the client's table and talk to him with authority about his products. When I handle all Tata Tea products and Mr. Krishna Kumar who till recently was uh, the number two man to Ratan Tata, he is on Tata Sun's board. He was the managing director of Tata Tea. And when he took on two vice presidents from Hindustan Lever to join uh, Tata Tea, one for South and one for North. He didn't ask them to come to Calcutta for training. He said, before you come to Calcutta, in Mumbai, go and spend two days with uh, publicists with Bharat, because he's handled all our products. Now, he had that faith that I know as much about, in fact, I know more about Tata Tea's brands even today than his managers know, because his managers keep on changing. I've launched these brands and I follow these brands. Even if I don't handle them, for me, they're my brands. So I haven't lost that sense of ownership. I remember once I launched Parley's Bailey Mineral Water and I haven't handled it for the last 15 years. But some five years ago I was passing near uh, Prabhadevi, Siddhi Vinayak Temple and there was one of the delivery vans going from there, Bailey Day. And there was a spelling mistake on that. And I went back and called up Parley's and I said, look, I don't know, I know that there was a van at this time at Prabhadevi and that van had a spelling mistake. No, I don't have to do it. He's not my client. But for me, Bailey is still my product. For me, 
Fantastic, fantastic. That Bailey does well. I feel good when I see that Bailey is. In fact, if I'm in a flight and I get Bailey water, I say that's my product. It's not my product. I haven't handled it. I was just an advertising agency. But for me, and if people, my people start thinking like this, that this is not what we are doing just to get an idea through, but we are doing it because this is our product. And I want to know all, know everything about these products. I, we didn't have to know about distribution of tea. When we were launching uh, Tata Tea, Kanan Devan, I went with the, uh, the, that time the general manager into small, small places in South. I went to Shimoga and I went to all kinds of places just to figure out how they do this. Who are the kinds of distributors? And they go and sit down there. And then he had warned me, he said, when you go there, if they offer you tea, drink it. Because it's an insult to these small town guys. If they offer you tea and don't drink it, they see it as an insult. So we used to keep on drinking tea, maybe 30 cups of tea. <laughs> and you had to drink it. And, and those were not those days of light teas with green tea and all that. It was like hard, you know, distinct tea. And you had to drink it. Because once or twice I said, nee, I don't want tea. He said, no, no, that, that's very insulting to them. You have to drink tea. But we learned like that. We used to go with the client, do the market visit, go and find out what people are saying. It's good that the liquor clients don't insist on that. Liquor clients did. <laughs> when I uh, was launching these products for Vijay Malia, I would stand there at a launch conference, sales conference, and I would stand there with a Coke in my hand. And once Vijay came and said, uh, that looks very bad, you know. We tell everybody that he's the guy who's done this campaign and all that. And you're standing with a Coke in your hand. At least hold the drink. Don't drink it if you don't drink it. <clears throat> I said, well, what difference does it make? <clears throat> they said, no, Bharat. They would not believe that you could do a good, good campaign for a product if you haven't used it yourself. And pardon my saying this, ladies, but I told him, I said, uh, Vijay, I launched a sanitary napkin for you last year. <laughs> which I did. We launched a sanitary napkin for him called Freedom. He owned one of these companies which had that thing. And I said, look, I came for that uh, press conference, uh, that sales conference, so it doesn't matter. So the point is, I was told that I must drink. I think it is fun having an advertising agency. <laughs> <laughs> we should all together float a company and start an advertising agency. <laughs> I think uh, it's time for questions now. Uh, I'm sure... The audience is going to have a good time asking you questions. Let us uh, start with Swati Barve, who will ask the first question today. Come on, Swati. Uh, can, she, can she have the mic, please? Yes. We need to be rapid with our questions. Yeah, good evening. And good evening. Uh, I'm really glad to ask first question to you. And uh, it was brilliant and you're really brilliant. Uh, my question is approximately what percentage one should keep aside for advertisement? No, there is no such rule because I think it depends on what product uh, category you are in, what is your competition doing, how much share of the market do you want. See, in advertising we have what we call an advertising to sales ratio, which progressively goes down. So you may have a launch budget which is very high, which may be 10% of your sales revenues, which next year may become 8% and you aim to make it 0.01%. Like when Kellogg's launched in India, I had met at the time the, uh, one of the CFOs or CEOs of Kellogg's and they said that Kellogg's realized that in India we have a breakfast habit. Each community has a different breakfast habit. Maharashtrians would have a poha or whatever thing. South Indians would have a idli or dosa or Gujaratis would have something. So everybody had, to, to your children you always gave what was there in the house. Everybody had breakfast. And to break into that habit and saying, instead of having poha or idli or dosa, have cornflakes, is going to take a long time. So they had a plan that for eight years, they will not make any money. They'll have to keep advertising year after year to break that habit that we will finally have to switch from your traditional breakfast foods to Kellogg. So eight years, they had a thing that we will not make any profit and we'll still advertise. So each market, each product, what competition you have, it changes. But Bharat, isn't it true that that is right for multinational corporations who have got deep pockets to bear the gestation period? They have deep what pockets. What is your suggestion for SMEs? See, multinational have two advantages. One is that they have deep pockets and one is that they blatantly lie. <laughs> you know, this is one thing I always say and people hate me for this. I mean, multinationals hate me for saying this. 
Indian companies never lie. At least I have not, not, not come across Indian companies that lie. I was launching for Amul milkshakes, which were called Amul real milkshakes. This is years ago. And we did a little survey and we found out that the most popular flavors in milkshakes by talking to these fruit juice stalls and things like that was strawberry and chocolate. And we went to Dr. Kurian and said, uh, let's launch with strawberry and chocolate. And he said, yeah, chocolate is fine because we have chocolate, we have cocoa, because we manufacture chocolates, we manufacture Nutramol, which needs chocolate. But strawberries I can't get. I said, you don't have to get strawberries, you, essence you use. He said, no, if it's an Amul product, it'll have to have real ingredients. So if I can't get strawberries, I will not launch the strawberry. I don't mind having lesser sales, but I'll only launch something that I can get. And he launched, we launched chocolate and elaichi. He said for Srikhand and things we get Elaichi, so Elaichi is easily available in Gujarat. He said, I don't mind taking a lesser market share, but I will not cheat the consumer by saying real milkshake and put essence in it, which only a, a, Amul can do. I handle some creative work for Vico. And once the Vico Vajradanti toothpaste sells in 38 countries, it costs a same size toothpaste, cost I think 60% or 80% more than a Colgate or a close-up. And it is still bought. And once I went to the chairman, uh, Gajanan Pendarkar, and I said, I just bought this uh, thing and it's very watery. So it doesn't stay on the toothbrush properly. It sort of dribbles down. Can't you do something about it? He said, no, Bharat, what happens is sometimes the bark that we use has more moisture. So it becomes watery. The next slot won't be like that. We can't add something else to make it uniform. But that's not fair. When we say we are natural, we have to remain natural. And nature has variations. So if it has more moisture in that one batch, now that only a Vico can do. A Hindustan lever would tell you lies till they're blue in the face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I launched India's first salt. Bharat, this video is going to go viral on the you YouTube. You can go anywhere. When I say this in front of Hindustan lever. Why do you think I keep on exercising? <laughs> that people can hate me, but they can't, they can't do a thing to me. They have to be far away from me and talk from a distance or send me hate mails, but they can't do anything else physically to me. No, the point is, I launched India's first Tata salt, was the first iodized salt. And uh, you know why salt is iodized? Because there are certain hilly areas in India where people in their normal diet don't get enough iodine. So they suffer from goiter. So iodine is the only prevent, preventive so that you don't get goiter. So government made it compulsory that you add iodine and make it iodized. So your salt has, so your normal food gets iodine. In Hindustan Lever launched a salt called Annapurna. They ran a campaign which said Annapurna has iodine so your child's mind becomes sharper and he can do better in school. And they had a little cute little kid who came running with a trophy and said, Mommy, I got a trophy and said, Annapurna salt did that be better. And because they have so much money, people start believing this. Kellogg's comes and says, Kellogg K will give you a figure that your husband will drool over <laughs> in 15 days. Yeah. How can you believe that no matter what Kellogg's tells you, that if you eat those cornflakes for 15 days and do nothing else, you'll have a fantastic figure like Bollywood film stars. Unless there's a small print that says, drink, uh, eat Kellogg's K, run for four hours in a day, starve yourself. Maybe there are other small print things. But this is lying to people. Cornflakes can't give you a figure that your husband will drool over. You have to do workout for that, you have to diet for that, you have to do all kinds of mad things to do that. Now, an Indian company won't do this. A Kellogg's would do it, a Hindustan lever would do it. Kellogg's would say iron shakti. Now, how much iron would a bowl of cornflakes have? That it gives you iron shakti. They had actually ran a campaign where they showed that when the man started eating Kellogg's cornflakes, his memory became great. And there was some theft in his house and remembered the number of the car where they sold on his property. Because he was drinking, he was eating Kellogg's cornflakes. And people believe this. Now, Indian companies would never do this. Multinationals lie through their teeth. 
So it's no great shame. We don't have to sort of look at multinationals and say they are great guys. They are not. We Indian companies are far better. Siddhu. <laughs> yeah. After Siddhu, this Russell. Good evening, yeah, Siddhu. Sir. Sir, with the launch of HD TVs, HD ch uh, channels, they say that uh, you will be able to enjoy a movie without an ad. So, what is the next innovation which uh, the advertising agen agencies See, are See, uh, doing anything without advertising is not a great idea because advertising takes away the great financial burden. It subsidizes your product. If Times of India or your whichever paper that you buy did not have advertising, you would have to spend maybe 150 rupees for each copy. If your Star TV did not have advertising for their sponsored programs, they'll not be able to show you the kind of sponsored program with the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, production values that they have. Then they'll all look like the old Doordarshan program used to look. Why Star, does, uh, Star TV and Z TV can do all this is because they can afford to spend 5-8 lakhs per episode and make all those fancy, I mean, all these programs, all the women look like they're dressed for a wedding even when they get out of bed, you know. So. They can't afford to have, give them those kinds of clothes unless advertisers sponsored it, you know. <laughs> so advertising but, uh, is I good. think Siddhu was also uh, wanting to know that if these type of strategies come out, but it does in, 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 in US it's working very well. You, because but, of the but, but you subscriber pay, cost being high? But you have to pay more. Yeah. They always say that you can get this channel for five dollars, but if you want it without advertising and without interruption, you pay fifteen dollars or twenty dollars yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So if you're willing to pay more money, I think in India that's soon coming, that they'll come with a thing saying, it's already there it's and, already it, there. and it'll it's keep already. on increasing, that they'll say, but very honestly, why would anybody do that? I personally find that advertising films are far more entertaining than some of the programs. You're, <laughs> you're better off watching those films rather than watching the programs, you know, they're far better, they're better looking people, they have, they're nice concept, they get over faster, so it's much more fun. <laughs> yes, Russell. Bharat, hi. It's Hi. wonderful hearing from you. It's, uh, I still remember the joke. I was in college at that time, the one about lions making love. Yeah. Uh, the question I want to ask you is, uh, given that online and uh, mobile uh, are growing so ex exponentially, yeah. uh, what would you say is the impact on creative from an advertising point of view in that medium? Uh, also, given that in television, you've got the 30 seconds. In, in Billboard, you've got that time. In online, you've got a couple of seconds. Here we're talking about dynamic content, we're talking about click-through ratios. Yeah. How would that impact creative? See, creative. digital advertising is the, the big thing today in advertising. Because uh, every agency, in publicists worldwide, we have a thing, we've started a whole division called Dialogue. Because what digital and internet and the social media advertising has done is, it has stopped being ad making advertising a one-way traffic. You're not just talking to a consumer. It's a dialogue now. They can talk back to you. And that's the most growing field. And that's very scary. You know, think of it that if you, let's say you bought any, you bought a, a Godrej refrigerator and if you weren't happy with it, in the past, all you could do is write to Godrej, go to the shop and say it's not working. If they didn't satisfy you, you could write to Godrej, whoever, and say, I'm not happy. And nothing happened. Today, if you do that, and if nobody replies to you, you put it on social network. Thing I bought thing and uh, maybe 10,000 people would read that and next time they would say I was just reading on Facebook that Godrej don't come back to your thing, let's not buy Godrej. The moment it becomes interactive, it becomes a dialogue, it, it's great for both the parties. It's good for the companies because they get honest feedback and it's good for the consumers because they can, they now have a say in the matter. And digital advertising, it see it's going to keep on sharpening things. When I got into advertising, uh, there was no television advertising. So there was only cinema advertising. And cinema films were one minute films. So there were 60 seconds you could tell a thing in. By the time I got into it, television started, it became 40 seconds advertising. We could even do one minute because it was, and that time they had two rates. On Doordarshan, they had two different rates. You could, if you showed stills, slides, it was one rate. And if you showed a moving film, they charged you double. But it became a 30 second commercial. Today, it's getting more and more, it's shrinking more and more. So it's now becoming 10 seconds because the costs are phenomenal. Which is damn good because that is what is sharpening creative minds. You know, even when we do a 30 second commercial, we all take into account that 7 to 8 seconds will go for the final product shot. Which means that 8 seconds are gone. 
but then the shot comes and your baseline comes and all that, eight seconds are gone, which leaves you with about 20, 22 seconds to tell the whole story and it has to also entertain the whole concept of what we call infotainment, information through entertainment is, is really fantastic now because people get bored of dull advertising. Which means, which is why they're using film stars, they're using songs, they're using, because it's entertaining. But it's not just entertaining, you have to sell your products through that entertainment, so it's infotainment. And the digital media and what is happening now is sharpening that further, because if you have 30 seconds, at least you know you have 20 seconds to entertain and sell your product. If you have 5 seconds, then what do you do? It's like Twitter, if you have whatever, 180 words, you've got to sharpen that, you know. And that's nice because it's… Uh, and it's also accountable, it's also… Uh, you can control your budgets, it's accountable, it helps you to understand what response you got from the campaign spend. Yeah, although it's advertising… It's a good mechanism for online yeah, media. except advertising accountability is always in doubt. There's somebody who made this famous statement years ago which still holds true, which says, I know that 50% of my advertising budget is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which 50%. <laughs> so that still holds true, you know, because… Accountability has increased in terms of now it's under your control. When we used to do films earlier, we used to do theatre advertising. So if you took 5,000 theatres across India, you really didn't know how many times a film was shown in a, a theatre in Coimbatore or in Dharwad. You didn't know that. You were paying for it. They told you that we are showing this film for five weeks, five times a day. But you had no way of checking it. Maybe at once in a while you could ask a salesman to go and see a film and check it. Now with television, that's become better because it's controllable. You can control Mr. Sikwera, yeah. he has to ask Sir, the question. It appears that you, know, you have handled most of the leading in domestic companies as well as international companies. Do you remember how many products you have undertaken till now as, as for campaigning? And out of that, what is the success ratio or failure ratio? Success ratio would be 10%. <laughs> we only talk about that. We never talk about 90% failures. <laughs> but yeah, I have handled a lot of things. There was a time when we used to say we've handled everything that from early morning you start eating, we've handled that. I've handled Britannia bread, I've handled Amul butter, I've handled Tata tea, I've handled Tata coffee, I've handled Britannia biscuits. So you, you know, I've handled Bank of India, State Bank, Exim Bank. Good night, hit. I mean, it's Sandoz, Calcium Sandoz, Glaxo's D, all the liquors. We handle the Indian Cancer Society campaigns. A lot of it. Now, then we handle L'Oreal and Nestle, Maggie. It, I mean, I've forgotten what all things we've handled. But it's, uh, but believe me, in all our life, whatever I have done, why do we always talk only of Amul butter or fruity? Because they worked. We don't tell you about the campaigns that didn't work. And there were many more. You know? For every one Amul <laughs> butter, there were maybe 50 which didn't work. And they didn't work for odd reasons. I mean, I don't know if we have time. Like, can I tell him? Yeah, sure, sure. Didn't work? I launched India's first, the most expensive tea in India at that time. It was called Prestige. Tata's, Tata's had launched it. It was, came in a, a, a metal can. And it was that time very expensive. And I had this great... It, they were launching it only in Delhi at that time, because it was only limited stock. And they said, let's launch in Delhi and then we'll see how it goes. And I had this brilliant idea that I went on this belief that, you know, all of us, the way we dress and things goes in a certain way. That we, there's a time when we wear these kinds of clothes because we can't afford anything better. We use cotton shirts or cotton trousers, then we earn more money. Then we, that time we used to go and have polyester, nylon shirts. Or, Terry cotton trousers. And then you start finding that as you go up, everybody starts dressing similarly. So even your pun in the office dresses the same way. Then the, to differentiate yourself, you again have to start wearing the clothes that you are wearing when you are very poor. So you stand out. So my whole thing was, if it's the most expensive tea, the person who drinks it won't be dressed very well because everybody is dressed very well. Even a Brookborn tea drinker is dressed very well. So I created this campaign which uh, had Shekhar Kapoor acting in it, he was a friend of mine and he directed the film also and he acted as a model also in that. And the whole thing began with uh, the Shekhar sitting there with a cup of tea in his hand and he says, you know, life, uh, nokar, chakar, shohrat, paisa, bahut zaruri hai, lekin sabse zaruri hai, 
प्रेस्टीज प्रेस्टीज होना जरूरी है बहुत है एंड देन एज ही इज टॉकिंग ही सिटिंग लाइक दैट ही इज वेरिंग ऑर्डनरी टी शर्ट पेटेड जीन्स एंड ही सिटिंग लाइक दिस एंड ही हैज अ होल एट द बॉटम ऑफ हिस शू एंड ही सिटिंग एंड टॉकिंग एंड एज द कैमरा सेट पुलिंग यू रियलाइज इज सिटिंग इन अ हेलीकॉप्टर एंड द हेलीकॉप्टर टेक्स ऑफ एंड ही इज द ओनर ऑफ द हेलीकॉप्टर एंड इट टेक्स ऑफ and he's still talking he's still drinking tea and talk, talking and the helicopter lands at some place like a mud island kind of thing there's a huge bungalow and there's a party going on there and they all commandos you know his bodyguards and dogs and he gets down from the thing and you realize that he is that rich he's filthy rich i mean he's dressed like that but he is very rich and then he is surrounded by the crowd and he looks back and he says so as i was telling you in life uh, money and all that is fine if you have prestige that's more important but if you have other things it's so much better and i thought it was a great film we launched that film and that bombed very badly <laughs> because i hadn't taken into account how punjabis think <laughs> i took into account the people that i know in bombay how they think that they think that it's okay to wear casual clothes i realized in delhi if you're rich you have to dress like a rich man you have to have a bmw you have to be traveling in a mercedes you have to wear a, a, a international a foreign brand watch so they thought that this is the bhangi ka shay hai ye kya hai matlab dress who's they wouldn't drink it they wouldn't touch it because we were promoting an image that they didn't want to buy because they wanted to see a rich man should look like a rich man this is where we go wrong we think see we always think I'll give you another example. I mean, I don't know how much time we have because we want more questions actually. But the problem is, he asked me a, a sensitive question about failures. <laughs> <laughs> about success, I could have finished talking in ten minutes. Failures will take me a long, long time. <laughs> I launched a tea again, again a tea for Tata Tea called Agni, which became the number one tea at that point of time, and I had done that tea as a tribute to indian women so my slogan my jingle was i don't remember the full jingle but the operative part was shakti ka hai roop yahi agni hai yahi naye samaj ki ummeedon ka prateek hai yahi agni chai and i to present to the client i collected clippings from different films of women who have made it you know we are talking about women empowerment now that's become a very cliched fashionable term to use but this is years ago but my whole thing was these are the women who made it so i showed a, a police commissioner as a woman i showed a judge woman i showed a pilot as a woman i showed a, a professor as a woman and we tried testing it we tested it in all the big cities mumbai pune delhi kolkata bangalore fantastic response the women loved it then we started showing it in small towns and we got a completely different response from the women in small towns I remember we went to a place called Chandosi, which is in UP or Bihar on the border of that. And there, women said, "Listen, we have no ambitions like this to be all this, and um, we, whatever our family likes, our husbands like, we bring. For our daughters, we have ambitions. And I, you wouldn't believe this, that the most respected profession across India, from Kerala to Bihar to wherever else, was teaching. They said we would like our daughters to be teachers." and they said you shown all this woman being a police officer and a pilot and all that you haven't shown her taking her children studies you haven't shown that woman sharing tea with her husband when he comes home you haven't shown her doing karwa chauth <laughs> and we suddenly realized that we were talking to women that we meet in our cities there's a whole india there where women think differently where men think differently and we had to change that concept we had to then add in a shot where the child came running and the mother was taking his studies and the husband came home and the mother was sitting with him and giving him tea we had to have for this we had to have a karwa chauth shot <laughs> we had to do that because if you were selling it all india we were not just selling it in urban centers and we it would have failed if we hadn't taken these corrective actions calcutta had a different thing altogether calcutta said we don't want to see all this here we have a thing called para discussions Where everybody gets together and they keep drinking tea and chatting on every subject and every Bengali has a view and he can talk on that view for the next two hours and everybody sits together and they keep drinking tea. So give us a tea that can keep on giving us more cups of tea. <laughs> so we actually had a different commercial made only for Bengal, which showed that there's a para discussion and they're fighting about Ramana Tagore and everybody has a point of view and they're shouting and then they're saying, "Acha, our chai leke aao." In Bengali, 
And that lady in the house says, look, now no more tea. Tell them if they want more tea to get it from their own house. They say, don't worry, we have Agni Chai that gives you more cups of tea. So each city, each, each, each region had a different... And you could fail if you went by what you saw around you. I mean, if I had to sell a tea to women in this room, I may sell it differently because you have different ambitions. But the Chandosi woman doesn't think like you. I mean, she at that time thought that my husband is my... We all thought we should go and get married to women in Chandosi because they were such lovely women. They all said, Hamara kush nahi hai, jo bhi unko pasand hai, hum wo karenge. So we all said, <laughs> we are in the wrong city, let's go there. And, and <laughs> can you help launch a tea which can make the woman think like that? <laughs> I think we should do reverse now. <laughs> I think Kunal has a question. Yes, Kunal. Uh, very good evening, sir. Good evening. My question is relevant to professionals. In many lines of work like lawyers, doctors, CAs, you cannot solicit work through advertising. Yeah. So how do these professionals create a brand of their own? Make See, even in advertising, I'll tell you one thing. Media advertising makes people aware. But the credibility is most through word of mouth. You believe what your friend tells you. You may read a huge ad in the papers. You may see a full page ad in Times of India, whatever paper. You may see a, a commercial for any product 10 times a day. But if your friend tells you or your family acquaintance tells you that it's not good, yeah, we've tried this, you'll never buy that. So these professions work primarily on word of mouth. That once people, if you're a doctor and if people start saying that, look, this doctor is very good and uh, I've tried him and it works very well. The doctors get more patients, not because he's advertising. His patients, previous patients become his advertising campaigns. And that is true even in product terms. When you use something and you say, I tried this and it worked. That is the best advertising you can ever get. Media advertising just makes you aware that there is a product like this and it can make you buy that thing once. It can't make you buy it again. If this one. Good evening, Bharat sir. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, what kind of advertising and marketing should a fitness brand use? A fitness See, fitness. I was involved when Gold Gym was being launched. They'd come to me and said, let's launch, uh, we are launching a gym here and things like that. So for a gym they that came time… To you, they came to you as an agency or as a model? <laughs> <laughs> no, they came to me as an agency. And in fact, Lena Mogre was involved in that, that time and then she… Almost, she, she headed that thing. We, we had initial meetings we had together. So they didn't have, they didn't want to advertise the brand, but they wanted to know how to come into it. But see, fitness brands, like the ones that I've handled were, like as I said, Nutramul we handled, which was a health drink for children. There we could, because we had the budgets, we had Dara Singh, and we had all these kinds of things happening. But fitness brand, a lot of people still don't understand how valuable this whole segment of fitness has become in this country. You know, Godrej has a thing called SoFit, which is a, uh, this thing drink, soya drink. I try to, I'm not the agency, but I know the people, so I try to tell them that, look, there's this huge fitness wave, and if soya is protein, let us forget everybody else, let's launch this as a great protein drink for an after-workout drink or a pre-workout drink. They didn't have the guts to do this because they don't know that there's a huge segment there. This whole fitness and body beautiful, what Bollywood has done, all the six pack abs and things like that. Every street corner has a gym now. There are people getting into fitness gear, they're buying fitness shoes, they're buying fitness, they're becoming members of all these gyms. And if you can slot your drink to cater to those people, it could work very well. It's a huge market. but very few people understand this. This whole thing of segmentation of a market. They say, no, no, we want to appeal to everybody. There's nothing like appealing to everybody. You must decide that this is my primary target group. I'm only talking to men and women who go to gyms. And there are thousands of them. In Delhi, every street has maybe four gyms. And if you just say, I want to launch SoFit to only cater to these people, they'll sell more SoFit than they're selling now. So fitness is a huge market, which very few marketing guys have realized. They are not aware of it. We'll take one last question now. Nagu wants to ask a question. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Bharat, really fantastic. Okay. You're on a roll and you're an amazing storyteller. Got to tell you this. And uh, we're thoroughly enjoying ourselves. 
my quick question to you is now you were saying that competition realizes competition but they really don't see the competition that's coming over for instance sony and stuff like that do you in the advertising industry look at competition as competition or do you have a competition that you have not looked at that's one part of my question second part of my question how do you look at social media you were originally in print and then it was tv media and social media is social media adding to your business or is it a threat it's adding to our business but social media the importance and the relevance has not been recognized by everybody so i just met somebody who is a vice president in charge of the social media thing of a very big agency in mumbai and he said clients always complain about giving us budgets to advertise in that they would rather spend that money on ipl matches thing because they know that thousands of see it sometimes becomes clients are not wise enough to know that it's not what they see it's what the consumer is seeing it's not what their friends see a lot of people get influenced by the thing of that we all sit and watch an ipl match so we must advertise with ipl they don't realize that maybe there are people who are not watching ipl and we can reach them through another medium so how you spend your money and how you break up where you are spending the money depends on how wise the advertising the advertiser is an agency could advise them but they have to be aware that you see most clients go by the thing of what they like and what their friends like if you advertise with me and if i do something for you advertising uh, for your product and you go for a cocktail party and all your friends talk about this you think it's a great campaign because everybody has talked about this you haven't figured out that but you are not selling to your friends you are selling to some people who are living in dombi blue you don't even meet when i launched london pills na there were these two lovely ladies who used to own the brand lawyers inia lawyer and bhaktavar and uh, i went and told them that you know your thing is called uh, don't don't say london pills na nobody calls it london pills they call it lp in those days she said don't be stupid nobody calls it lp they call it pills na i said listen to me they call it lp so they said hello they, she called her sister and she said tell me when we go to the club what do they call i said which club they said willingdon club so willingdon club called it pilsner but willingdon club was not buying quantities of london pilsner beer there were these bars at badala and and malad where people go after office and drink they were buying that drink but people go by what they see around them they don't look at who their consumer really is if they can be aware of this that my target group is not willingdon club they may buy 20 cases but the the malad pubs are buying 200 cases so i need to find out what they are saying and not what my friends are saying if they are aware of that that's a wise advertiser and it always works and his one part of the question was how do you look at unknown competition to your business advertising agencies we can't we are as bad as everybody at least i am maybe there are wiser advertising guys but so you need to wait till it comes and takes you over till it hits you yes lopa last question yes sir when uh, an ordinary brand or a regular brand how can advertising put it into the next league by by you know how can you put a regular brand into a different league altogether with you know do you have some example where you with the right advertising the right advertising yeah i mean you know most brands are so similar today there was a time when brands had product advantages i launched seat i launched that seat rhino i created and i launched that bond tough that time seat had told us that we have the technology that no other tire company has we have the toughest tires so we could do that bond tough and thing today every tire company has the same technology so all products are very similar to each other you know internationally they have done surveys and found that i think 85% or some such huge figure of people can't tell the difference between coke and pepsi in a blind test and i think over 65% people in a blind test can't tell the difference between coke and sprite if you don't show them the color don't show them the label and make them drink it this is internationally they can't tell the difference i think 65 or 67% could not tell which is sprite and which is coke even though sprite is a little sweeter regardless no color no label blind these are blind tests and these are figures of these companies so the only thing that can take your brand to a different level is if you can create some innovative ideas around that i mean i i didn't start amul amul wasn't my creation amul was already existing the amul baby existed the utterly buttery line existed i just indianized it 
But when Amul was launched, if they had done what every other uh, butter was doing at that time, then there were international, there was, I believe, Anchor Butter of New Zealand, and there was a big butter called Polson's, which was the leading brand at that time, much before my time. And if they had stuck to doing a similar thing by saying that we have a creamier butter or more golden, your family loves it, they would have got lost in that thing. But then it would have been who spends more money. They said, let's not do this. Let's do something which is completely different. Let's do a cartoon girl making statements on a hoarding. Hoarding was never used before that as a prime medium. Hoarding was always a reminder medium. You had a film, you had a press ad, and hoarding was just a reminder of that. Like people are using it now. Amul was the first product which said, let's use hoardings as our prime medium. So they broke away from the tradition and said, if we have to sell the same product, let's do it differently. And that clicked. You know, people started liking that kind of a thing. So the best way of selling a product and taking it to a different level is to do something completely different than what others are doing. Fantastic. I think that's the end of the session. And uh, can we all clap for him? Thank you. There was one question. Uh, can I take one last question and answer it? Please. <laughs> <laughs> there was one question that always gets asked of me uh, whenever I go and talk at institutes and things. Is that they say, you created this language, English. And they say, you are, I, mean, I am called the father of English and things. And I always tell them that, look, there was nothing as intelligent as that. You know, I come from a Marathi medium school. I couldn't speak English till I came to college. I came from a Marathi medium all-boys school in Girgaum called Aryan. And uh, then I joined Elphinstone, which was that time Elphinstone and Xavier's were these two big South in Bombay colleges. And um, I couldn't speak English. I, all my subjects were in Marathi. We had lower English in 8th standard, our English started. We had one subject called English, where it was things like, this is a boy. His name is Ram. This is a girl. That is his friend. And we had English like this in 8th standard. And then I did my SSC and came to Elphinstone. And I still remember the first day in Elphinstone that we had 145 girls and 5 boys in my class. I had never seen so many girls in my did life. Did you pay a big donation to get in that Are you fantastic. I, my <laughs> life got ruined because of that, you know, because I got so used to the thought that there are only 4 or 5 boys around you and 145 girls that when I came in the real world after college, I realized that there are equal number of men and women, <laughs> which was a traumatic thing for me, you know, that I didn't expect that. But 145 girls and 5 boys. And one guy who's still around, he has a shop at uh, near Regal called Hasmuk Shah. He was a blind guy. So he wasn't interested in girls. <laughs> then there was another guy who was the principal's son. My principal was uh, Mr. Pushi Rege at that time and his son Manoj uh, was in my class. Now his parents stayed on the top floor so he couldn't be seen talking to girls. Either his father or mother would catch him and so he wouldn't talk to girls. That left three of us. You know? <laughs> then one guy was very studious. He was this thing that I'm here to study. So he wouldn't even look around. That left two of us and you don't have to believe this, but I was better looking than the other guy. <laughs> did you, did you, did you have but, the… But the thing is, he spoke English. I couldn't speak English. Even but if did, girl did came, you have the same hairstyle then also? This, hair, this is another story. That's another, if you have time, I'll tell you all these stories. <laughs> this is because I got fooled by an advertising campaign. I read a shampoo which said, all clear. <laughs> So, even if a girl came to me and said, shall we bunk the next lecture and go for a film, I would answer that in my mind in Marathi first. I would say, me, Aila ghari jevela hai toh sangeet lai te, me yau shakat nai. Then I would translate that in my mind. I have told my mother, I am coming home for lunch, so I cannot come. Then I would say that two, three times to make sure I am saying it properly. By the time that girl would go for a film and come back, by the time the, I had the answer ready. So I had to do something very fast because I always say I had 145 reasons to learn English fast. <laughs> and I realized that I used to get stuck, all of us who come from Marathi or Gujarati or Hindi medium schools, we know English. It's a conversational English that we get stuck in because we do not know the correct words to use in a sentence. So I started using a Marathi word. I knew Gujarati, so I started using Gujarati words. And suddenly that became fashionable. People said that is a fashionable new language. And Bharat is a creator. It wasn't some creation, it was a handicap that I had. So I had to do a thing like this. So 
Last question. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I think we should all applause, uh, applaud for. Wonderful. That's how much they have enjoyed. <laughs> This video will be watched by thousands and lakhs of people world over. Bharat, it was a pleasure having you here. Pleasure. I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for a very hilarious evening. A very hilarious evening. I would like to request uh, Shugra to hand over a memento to you. to request uh, Mr. Piyush Vaas to hand over the coffee mug. I would like to request Mr. Sikwera to say a word of thanks before we conclude. I am very thankful to Mr. Rajesh for having uh, invited us. But at the same time, I am I'm, a uh, little angry on him. Because he cut down the wonderful <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the wonderful, you know, the, the replies were going on. So he abruptly stopped him and told, started question and answers. I think we would have been happy to be more uh, to hear him. I think uh, really, see, anyway, see, I am 64 year old. Of course, my hair also says that. Okay. He uses a white dye. <laughs> anyhow, I have never heard till today a such a successful person in business, in his in future. At the same time, so humorous, so simple. We are very, very uh, happy today to hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends.